first, the feature of this week's CEC report is a very important expose we have just put out to intervene in the hysteria that is um, rising in Australia at the moment, mm -hmm. Craig, about terrorism. And we've, we've headlined this section, Australia is under terror threat from an imperial secret police apparatus intent on keeping us at war. So we have just released this flyer for distribution around the country. And it's headlined, British SIS slash ASIO planning a terrorist attack on Australia, question mark. Um, which needless to say is explosive what we're implying there, well, more than implying. Robbie, it's also coming in the context that we don't make these these questions uh, lightly. If people go back to what we put out in 2002, yep. that's 12 years ago now, Robbie. We put a new citizen out calling facing the depression a fascist police state or economic development, uh, let's see here. which I wanted to mention early up because in that paper we go through pretty much the same scenario that we as Australians are facing today with exactly the same laws, right, that are causing the sorts of terror themselves in the yep. population yep. Uh, that were brought in under the post 9-11 period. This is, this is definitely, so this is not for, some for those with a long enough memory, this is definitely a replay of what happened back then. A replay and an extension. There's been no let up in this for these 12 years. We haven't seen the economic development necessary like we're seeing particularly in China and India and other places of the world. And consequently, what is happening is with the collapse of the financial system globally that we talk about consistently on this program, what we are seeing is a desperate government as part of the, the British Empire's ruling government putting into place police measures in order to control populations. And everything else is a cover story. And, and Craig, we use the word government. What we're talking about also specifically is something that gets to exercise the power of government but actually, it's not, we're not talking about the elected government, Tony Abbott. These guys just become pawns in this. There's a permanent secret government, secret police apparatus that runs countries like Australia, um, Britain, all the British top countries that runs them, and even the United States to a degree, except theirs is, has more, slightly more transparency through the Congress. It's far less in our countries, and this is you know, off the leash. And I wanted to read the opening paragraph of this fly just so the viewers understand what we're saying and they can get the details of this off our website. So the opening paragraph says, as things presently stand, a near-term terrorist attack upon Australian soil is almost guaranteed. Why? Is it because there are so many terrorists out there, whether homegrown or returning from Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan or elsewhere, such that at least one lone wolf is bound to slip through? No. It is because the British Crown and City of London, which control the British and Australian intelligence services, intend for such an attack to occur. And right on cue, legislation is now pending in Australia, the Australian Parliament, which will grant virtual immunity to any Australian officials who orchestrate or participate in such an attack. And that's the part that's particularly, um, that, that people should be afraid of. In fact, well, the, the legislation, the first part of it went through last night, Robbie. That's right. So as of last night, you can be jailed for 10 years for exposing an ASIO agent and uh, you can be jailed for reporting on an ASIO operation, mm. right? The other things I want to pass is immunity for, for, from prosecution for ASIO officers and ASIO affiliates. And that ASIO affiliates is a new term, Craig, that's just been injected into the security legislation in Australia, which has got a lot of experts worried because it can include private contractors and it can include foreign spies. So um, if you have heard George Brandis talk about to try and placate Senator David Lionholm's concern about torture, oh, we don't torture in Australia, well, um, don't close your eyes to the fact of what, how much torture has, it, has gone on in West, by, by, you know, at, the, at the hands of Western powers in the last 12 year period since September 11, 2001, which was contracted out to um, countries where torture was legal and allowed to happen, mm. right? These types of things. Rendition. Um, that's right. There's the, they, they called it rendition. 
So these, these are, you know, there's, there's loopholes that are permanently built into this so that these um, agencies can not go rogue, be rogue in, the, in terms of the way we, we, we um, uh, think about it. And that's what we're documenting here as something that people should be afraid of. Because once you establish that permanent secret police apparatus and with, with um, uh, laws that keep it secret and are out of any accountability to any democratic controls in your country, you are, you've gone you know, down a path which you're not going to easily return from. Um, and what's the motive here? Well, it's, there's, a, there's a war question. Craig, you've, re you've alluded to it, but I just want to elaborate uh, on the, the replay of 2003 idea. You know, post the Iraq war and the discovery there was no weapons of mass destruction, the Australian people, the British people, the European people, the American people, they all, you know, eventually wised up and thought this was rubbish. What we were sold was rubbish. And if you paid attention, the terrorist attack, which we talked about here, the actual attack, 9-11, was an inside job, an obvious inside job. We've documented how the funding came via the Saudis, which is a British client state, Saudi Arabia, right? Um, and it's a, you know, when you talk about, is, if you want to be afraid of Muslims and is, is Muslim fundamentalism, it means the most mus fundamentalist Muslim state in the world, yet it's our unquestionable ally. And they provided the funding to create the circumstances where an agenda that people like Tony Blair in the UK had been hatching since, 2000, since 1999 of um, allowing the Anglo-American powers to say, well, we, who, because of who we are, we reserve the right to topple governments at will. They called it regime change, right? And we have the right to do preemptive strikes to do that. Preemptive strikes which had been made illegal after World War II, because that's how Hitler started World War II with the argument of we need to do preventive war, that type of thing. And they just took the terrorist attack to, to twist it, to turn it into a war agenda that they already had, mm. right? And that is the replay now, driven by the fact that the powers that are pushing this are losing the economic basis of their power, which is the transatlantic London Wall Street financial system, right? It's going down the gurgler really fast. Mm. So, um, you know, people have to keep that big picture in mind to sort of see through what we're talking about. So what I want to do, Craig, I want to take a break now. When we come back, we'll go through some of the, the specific predicates of this flyer, especially highlighting the relationship between ASIO in Australia and MI5 in London and why that should worry people. Welcome back to the CEC report, where we are discussing the subject Australia is under terror threat from an imperial secret police apparatus intent on keeping us at war. So, Craig, as we discussed before the break, we've, we've issued this flyer to expose to the average Australian that um, what the hysteria about terrorism that they are currently being bombarded with um, has a, a political motivation, right? And it's war and um, a fascist police state, and we talked about the laws that are, that are being passed in our name um, before the break. Specifically to deal with, Robbie, the fact that the global financial system that we've talked about a lot in this program is in a process of rapid disintegration. Yep. And it's very interesting when you look at how much coverage there is on the actual G20 or anything like that, and the discussions that are going on, there's just about nothing that hasn't been shrouded by this terrorism issue right now, and that's telling in and of itself. And one of the reasons, Craig, um, that, that, that there's a general need for a police state. Of course, when you have economic meltdown, ordinary people start becoming antsy. Mm. Ordinary people are at, at risk of rising up and saying, we've got to do something about this. And in fact, um, people have probably heard over the last few years about the austerity in Europe, and there was lots of riots and whatever. There are documented cases where the crackdown on those rioters in places like Greece used laws that were passed post 9-11 in the name of fighting terrorism, mm. right, to actually crack down on the, on the population. So that's a, that's a general thing. What we're trying to blow the whistle on is this secret police apparatus that, we've, that we're establishing in Australia. And what this documents is the relationship between ASIO and MI5. Now, MI5 is part of the British SIS, Secret Intelligence Service. And what might shock people is that it does not answer to 
the British government per se, the elected British government. MI5 doesn't answer to them. MI5 answers to the Crown and only the Crown, right? Now, the Prime Minister plays a role in that purely as the Prime Minister, no one else in the Cabinet, no one else in the Parliament. The Prime Minister plays a role in, and, and on behalf of the Crown can, can um, decide what's made public or not or, or participate in deciding what's made public or not. But then in some cases, such as the, when um, we had our terrorism threat raised here two weeks ago right, by ASIO, that for no reason, ASIO said, well, there's not a particular threat, so why were they doing it? Well, well, MI5 had done it in London two weeks earlier. That part of MI5 that had raised the threat, that doesn't even answer to the Prime Minister. That is answerable to no one in the government structure. They just raised the threat in the lead up to the, um, the NATO summit. Now, ASIO was set up in the early 1950s, Craig, and that was in the, the Cold War, and people might remember the Petrov affair and whatever. Um, but from, its, from the ins outset, ASIO always called MI5 head office, right? That's the relationship yeah. that this organisation in Australia has. Now, what people have to understand is when we talk about ASIO, don't confuse ASIO with the police. No. They're, they're, not the state, they're, not, they're not the same as the state police or the Australian federal police. And arguably there are aspects of the police forces that probably have too much power and abuse it, but at least the police forces are answerable to the governments in where they operate. ASIO is not. But ASIO gets to t deploy those police forces as part of its um, operations. Now, why is this so important? Not just because of the unaccountability factor. It's so important because under MI5's regime in England, for decades, London has harboured actively harboured the world's worst terrorists and terrorist organisations. Harboured them, right? That's the word, harboured. Given them actual protection against their governments that have wanted to hold them accountable. And there's a book that's been written, because, you know, the, the, the guy be decapitating people in, in, um, for ISIS there, mm. there's no accident that he's a POM, right? Got a POMI accent. Um, this is something that's been incubating in London for a long time. So just let me draw something out here, Robert, because what you just said, for the, for the benefit of our viewers, is that MI5 is only answerable to the Crown. So this idea of harboring, harboring terrorists and so forth is, is a policy of the Crown? It's a, exactly. It's a strategic a, it's policy. It's a strategic policy. Why? Well, maybe you can explain that. I, mean, I, I know why, but I think it's important to elaborate that for our viewers. Because what the, what the Crown wants to do is undermine the actual development of nation states. Developing nation states, wherever they are, are a threat to the Anglo-American hegemony of the world, mm -hmm. right? Which we've talked about a lot on this program. Exactly. About the nature of the fight is actually an issue of sovereignty versus this imperial Anglo-American British Empire dominated system that we have today. And, and if you can run dirty tricks operations inside a country that undermine the way that country can operate, and you can create the kind of, well look, take Syria for instance, right? Syria is a target because it's an ally of Russia and because it houses the world's, hosts the world's biggest Russian naval base outside of Russia. So it's, it was the next target in the agenda of regime change. So they create an insurrection inside Syria. We're told that oh, they're moderate Syrians are, you know, um, resisting this monster, Ashtar, etc. These guys, I feel sorry, Craig, for the, for the, I feel dreadfully sorry for the poor Americans and Brits who got beheaded um, because they thought they went over there. They, I think they must have believed the propaganda. They go to Syria thinking that the people against Assad are moderate and great, right? And they're, we're on their side. They go there. In one case, those people kidnapped them and sold them to ISIS and they ended up being beheaded, mm. right? So it's things like that. Um, but it's the London role in this as a, as a strategic policy. But I, just to document how extensive this has become. So in the, there was a book written in 2006 called The Suicide Factory, Abu Hamza and the Finsbury Park Mosque that reports that um, at one point, terror suspects living in Britain were wanted, quote, by over a dozen friendly governments. Among these, Russia claims prominent Chechens who helped organise the bombings on civilian targets in Moscow are sheltering in London. The Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankan, Israeli and Turkish authorities, together with half a dozen European allies and the US government, have all presented Whitehall with lists of suspects they want to put on trial, but all of them are still waiting. The prominent French judge Jean-Louis Brugere 
was so appalled by Britain's attitude that he talked of Londonistan as being the city of choice, as a safe haven for Islamic terrorists and a place full of hatred. Now, Craig, you'll probably remember in, in 1998, we demonstrated outside the British consulate in Melbourne here because it was in the wake of what's called the Luxor Massacre, which mm. we tend to forget these pre-9-11 events. 65 tourists were massacred in Egypt by a terrorist organisation called Islamic Group that was headquartered in London and its leaders in London had all been convicted of murder in Egypt, but they were given asylum in London and the Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak, was ballistic about it. But that was one example of how this works and we, we, we demonstrated to say that Britain should stop harbouring terrorists. Osama bin Laden was able to live in London during the 90s while the Americans were looking for him, right, as, as part of this arrangement. And then you come back to Australia, because we've, we've also, in this flyer, highlighted the, as a case study um, two examples. Khalid Sharouf, who went to Syria and held up the severed heads with his sons. Everyone saw that picture. He was known to ASIO. Not just was he known, he'd been convicted of terrorism and served time for terrorism. So he was very well known to ASIO, yet he was able to flee Australia on his brother's passport. And this guy is described as pretty dumb, by the way. And then, a few months later, ASIO allowed his wife and son to travel to Syria and join him, right? And, of course, then we get the shocking pictures, and it's like, oh, this is, this is just the, the lone wolf slipping through. No, it's not. Um, even this young guy here in Melbourne the other night, Craig, you know, it's shocking, and we're, we're, who knows what we're being told. But what, it, what does stick out to you is ASIO knew has known of him well in advance of this. This is not just something that just erupts out of... There's not, they're not really lone wolves in that sense. They're, mm. they're already known to this security apparatus. Um, and then there's the case of Hizbut Tahrir. And Hizbut Tahrir was this organisation that shocked us all in 2012 when the Benghazi terror attack happened at the US consulate in Libya on September 11 that year because they rallied about this video insulting the Prophet Muhammad. And at the rally in Sydney... There were kids holding up signs, behead those who insult the prophet. And everyone said, well, who, what is this organisation? Well, this is an organisation that had been banned in virtually every country in the world, except the UK. And in Australia, it hasn't been banned because when the Premier of New South Wales asked ASIO to ban it, they said, no, well, we're not was Mor banned in the UK. Morris Yemmer, wasn't it? Morris Yemmer, yeah, right. back in 2007, had asked for it to be banned. No, it's not banned in the UK, so we're not going to ban it here. Yeah. And this is the type of organisation, they don't go and do terrorists themselves, terrorism themselves per se, but they recruit young people, right, and radicalise them so that they, then they become that. So anyway, that's, um, and that follows on from the press release we put out a few weeks ago called British Oligarchy Planning New 9-11 to Trigger World War III, which we discussed at the time. People should get this off our website, read the details on it, and distribute it widely because we cannot allow this kind of dirty tricks, secret police apparatus to operate in Australia. And the more it's known, then the less it can get away yeah, with. Sean, there's a very strong light on this. Yep. Yep. All right, so we've spent a lot of time on that. We'll take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll talk about the optimistic side of the world's future. Mm -hmm. 